Welcome back to the Metal Voice. Nick Bocott, guitarist extraordinaire, of course, one of the founders of A Grim Reaper as well, and uh, a teacher, a podcaster in a way, right? Tell us about what you're doing right now, Nick. I've just finished teaching. I work at Sweetwater, which is a, a blessing because I get to do what I love and what I do on the as my second job, if you would, my, um, what do they call it? I don't care what they call it, but I basically, like in the evenings I teach purely because I love to teach. Okay. And the fact that I've got four kids and a wife that loves shoes to steal from Zach Wilde has something to do with it too. But joking aside, people say, why do you, why do you work in the evenings as well? It's like, it's not work. I'm passing on guitar knowledge, what little I know, to people who, who love heavy metal guitar. So that to me is just a great hang. It's sure. it's a great hang, and I get no greater pleasure than passing on, you know, be it an Iron Maiden riff, be it a dime bag lick, be it something I did, be it Slash, whatever. It's when when you see a penny drop moment with a kid or a or an adult, it's it's a great feeling. I think the word you were looking for, the phrase is content creator, right? The, yeah, content. It sounds creator. so weird. It sounds so weird, doesn't it? It's it's to, like to me, it sounds very, it's very pompous. Oh, I'm a content creator. It's like no, you're not. You you've got a freaking video camera. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the big question today here on the Metal Voice is Iron Maiden, made in Japan. What made this EP live album so special and so loved over the years? It was big back in the day. I could tell you in Canada. It sold a hundred thousand copies. Sure Think about that. It's crazy, crazy. Probably because it was priced right, because those only five songs versus, let's say, an album was let's say ten dollars. This might have been five dollars, yeah. right? But look at that artwork. Beautiful. It's uh, it's the it's what you'd expect from Iron Maiden, and it was you know it was the killers lineup at their peak, yeah. you know because. It was, it was obviously Diano still, Clive Burr, Steve Harris, of course, Dave Murray, Adrian Smith was in the fold. He came yeah. in, you know, yeah. For, yeah. for the Killers record that came out that same year, 81. Mm -hmm. You know, the first record they made with Birch, you know, there's, the, there's that infamous Derek Riggs artwork of Eddie. Rumor has it, the initial cover was actually Eddie holding up Diano's. Well, I, could I, I could tell you what the original artwork was. It was that. So they printed up something like 250,000 copies of the head shot of Diano. Derek I've Riggs confirmed this. He confirmed this with us. Uh, but because every, they were planning on letting Paul Diano go, right. they didn't want to have that cover because it would have caused too much chaos on their killers tour at the time. Right. So Derek, uh, sorry, Rod Smallwood said, listen, guy, uh, listen, Derek, we need you to create another cover. This was the was second tour. cover. Yeah not to freak out Paul Diano on tour. So they ditched 250,000 album covers, I guess, and they must have sent them off to Brazil or something. But <laughs> well, I've got to tell, I've, 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 I haven't seen an original version of that, but I've seen the picture. That second cover is far superior, in my I, opinion. You know what? It, it's like a novelty, that. the first one, because, you know, Paul yeah. was not in the band anymore, so or he was. Interesting enough, look, look at these numbers, the statistics here. So, or sorry, the dates, I'll say. It was released September 14th. Right. Bruce Dickinson officially joined the band September 26th. Right. So it was actually so so it was... 12 days before. <laughs> I his ass. Yeah. <laughs> Strange enough. Uh, this the reason why they pulled out the CP because they were touring Japan at the time and the Japanese audience wanted something special to commemorate Iron Maiden going to Japan. The original Iron Maiden Japanese version was called Heavy Metal something, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You're right. Heavy Metal Army in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> Heavy Metal Army. And it did not have, I believe, Rothschild on it. No, it was a four. I, I think initially when it came out in Europe and Japan, it was just four. It was the four tracks. What were they? Running Free, Remember Tomorrow, Killers. And I think Innocent Exile was the other one. I think Rothschild was missing. I yeah, Rothschild came one. out later. But on the international version, it was the five track version with, with Rothschild. That's right. And a lot of people confuse this album. There was two nights in Japan. There was... Uh, 
Tokyo, which was night two, and Nugaya, which was night one. This was taken, oh no, Osaka, sorry, 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 Osaka Festival Hall. This was the Osaka one. And then right. there's like a long version of Made in Japan, which was a radio broadcast in Tokyo. Right. That was two or two days later, or a day later. And that's floating around as a bootleg, like the complete show. Right. Which I'm hoping for a reissue one day. That'd be nice. Yeah, yeah it would be. I mean, but to, why is it so big? Well, number one, Maiden was on the very precipice of gargantuism. I mean, they mm -hmm. were huge in England anyway. Yeah. They were really, 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 really big and getting bigger, you know. And they were firing on all six at that time. There was an electricity back then. I had the good fortune of, I'm sure you know who Neil Kay is. Of course. I've interviewed Neil a few times, yes. Yeah, Neil was, a, Neil, like Neil, was such, Neil was such a pivotal character in the new wave of British heavy metal alongside the likes of the late, great Malcolm Dome. May yes. he rest in peace. Love that guy. Um, Jeff Barton, of course, you know, Sounds, Kerrang, yada, yada, yada. There were a few guys that were pin it, but he had this, you know, like the like the sound house thing. And it became so big, he was the first person in my knowledge to have a heavy metal disco. <laughs> and, and and heavy metal discos became a thing in England, so much so that, that, that before there was an official heavy metal chart, the big three newspapers, Sounds, Melody Maker, and New Musical Express, which were weekly, Sound started it, Melody Maker quickly followed, then New, New Musical Express. They would have heavy metal charts in every issue based on those DJs, which is how it, Grim Reaper first got notoriety, even before Steve joined, was we had a, a demo called um, Bleed em Dry, and I was the guy that wouldn't quit. I was like the energizer bunny. It's like, okay, there were these guys out here. I would, I would scour, I would find phone numbers, I'd find addresses, and I would send stuff. You know, you just put stuff. You had to get a stamp, kids. You had to put something in an envelope, put it in a damn box. There were no cell phones. You couldn't email anybody. You just sent it on a wig and a prayer. And they, they would base the charts on responses to the you know, crazy great yeah. stuff. But, but it was it. It was a great time to be alive because there was a you you were watching something grow from the roots up, and Neil K got so damn big, deservedly so. Not only was the MC, he the MC at the first Monsters of Rock that I attended, but prior to that he did or around that year time, actually it was prior to that, because he did a tour as a DJ playing really big venues. There were three bands opening. There was a band called, they were called Nuts. They became Rage or Vice, vice Versa. I'm not sure. They had a deal. But there was an unsigned Saxon and an unsigned Iron Maiden. And I saw that show in Manchester when I was wow. a kid. Wow. Unsigned. Unsigned. So it was pre-Dennis It was pre -Dennis Stratton. There was a blonde guy whose name I forget playing guitar. And, and the head, which became Ed, was uh, this paper mache thing. <laughs> With a hose pipe coming out of the mouth with dry ice, you know, it was it was DIY. Was, was Paul Diano singing, or is it yeah. uh, Dennis no, Wilcox? Okay, no, it was it, it was Diano because I, I've actually somewhere I've still got the sound the, like they put out like the sound house EP. Yes, like there's a red one, and I I bought it at the venue. I've still got it somewhere. It sits, wow, well, I it sits with my EMI version of Anarchy in the UK. I just remember. I remember seeing those guys and going, holy crap. You know, Saxon was brilliant too, don't get me wrong. Of course. But Maiden had something, because like, Paul Diano, I mean, I'm a huge Bruce Dickinson fan, duh, but Paul Paul had this punk element. Like, he looked like he could be in the Sex Pistols. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he, he had an attitude, He had, and I, I liked his voice, you know, like, remember, yeah. like, remember tomorrow, I, as... I love I love Bruce's rendition of, of all the old stuff, but Paul singing "Remember Tomorrow" remains untouchable in my humble opinion because it yeah. his voice so per I, that's probably one of my favorite Iron Maiden songs of all time, and that's no disrespect to Bruce at all. It's that's just kudos to Paul, and there was just a vibe, there was an energy, there was a vibe, there was you know it was, it was Judas Priest meets. It was almost because of Paul. It was almost like Judas Priest meets Motorhead because of that. You know, like, like Lemmy was the first. Lemmy was the first guy to put a, together a band where punks went. That's cool. Metal guys went yeah. cool because it was. It was they were just a great freaking rock band with attitude. And Paul had some of that. Some of that. And I think you know, Main Japan. There's some energy on that record, man. Like if you listen to it even today, 
Can you imagine being in that hall when they played that? You know, you know, it's interesting. Palpable. I was thinking, I, I was thinking about this a lot. I go, why has it endured? Why do fans really? It's just a five song EP, a live EP, and I and I and I, I kind of figured out why people love it so much. A of course, <laughs> a the cover, right? But we know yeah. the songs. A the cover, let that's a no brainer. I think it's because the first side. It's you have Running Free and Remember Tomorrow. And then the second side, you have the Killers, Killers, Rothschild, and Innocent Exile. The first side, the production on the first Iron Maiden was rough. I like it, but a lot of people have said the production is not where it should have been. At least the band says that. So the main Japan brought the production up on the on, compared to the original album. Whereas on Killers, the production was heavy and it kind of brought it down a bit. So everything sort of became exactly where you needed it to be if you're into heavy metal and that raw energy. Uh, right. Well, well, what's interesting, I think I haven't looked at what, what does it, does it, does it, what production credit does he give? Or does it give Doug Hill production credit? All tracks recorded in mass uh, in Nagoya produced and mixed by Doug Hall. Yeah, Doug. I know Doug. Doug Hall. I got to know because because he 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 was part of the Maiden Smallwood camp, and Mister Smallwood also managed Halloween. So Doug Hall was front of house for Halloween when we toured with him in nineteen eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great front of house engineer. Great. Yeah. So he captured that. Doug was a great. So yeah, it could be right. It could, like I said, you, you know what I'm saying. Like, like the also, first album production was here, the second album was here, so everything kind of like went this way. So I, that's just my theory. No, it's it's not a bad theory. I do think it's 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 one of those times where this, and there's also there's a big difference between live and in the studio. Sometimes there's an, there's because the like the the there's a symbiotic relationship between the band and the audience. And sometimes yeah. that becomes palpable. And you can, I think you can hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But I agree. A, a band firing all, on all six with a, a very enthusiastic audience and probably in a great, in a great sounding hall. And it's just like magic, like lightning in a bottle. That's that kind of what it is. You, you know, I was trying to dissect this album. I go running freeze actually sped up version compared to, Right. the original song right it's if you actually listen to the made in japan version it's it's it speeds up and it's more yeah. punkier in a sense right where the album track is a little less slower remember tomorrow it's more dry on the original album where now it's got a little more um oh, uh, space yeah. or more yeah. more more ambiance maybe and uh rothschild it just rothschild killers and innocent exile just equally I would love them. I love the studio versions, and I love the live album version of those as well. So equally as good, but different. Yeah, and I, I also love the fact it's it's like a tongue in cheek play on you know. Yes. And by, yes. And by, yes. Well, yes. I'm sure that didn't go like the humor was not lost on people. When when Bruce when when they transitioned from Paul to Bruce for for me as a young teenager, very young teenager, I didn't even know it was happening. Because I was in Canada, right? Right. <laughs> so to me, it's like I just got you know made in Japan. All right, I picked up Killers. All right, I got the first album. I'm all set. Paul Diano, what a great singer! And then just to find out, maybe I don't know, 18 months later, you know, I'm hearing "Run to the Hills" on the radio. I go, "What's going on?" That doesn't sound like Paul Diano. <laughs> what was happening? Do you remember that transition from Diano to Bruce? Well, see, the thing is, you got to remember, like Bruce, like you know, this goes back to the. Like the new wave of British heavy metal, there was a band called Samson. Yes, of course, yeah. And you know, Bruce was in Samson. So English, I don't know if Samson ever made it to America, but in England, Bruce had a name already as as the side. You know, it's like yeah, holy, yeah, yeah. holy. You know, I saw the first. I became good friends with Paul Samson, who's sadly no longer with us, but lovely guy. But I remember seeing them. Opening for Robin Trower on the Victims of the Fury tour in yeah, that yeah. back in the day, and you know Bruce had one of those voices when you would go, "Oh, that's special." Yeah, so yeah. It, it was no shock, like like to a lot of people. And this is not taking away from Paul Diano at all, because I really liked those. This there was mm -hmm. something. There was he was a character, 
like he was he's kind of it's it's almost like David E. Roth versus Hagar in a weird way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, the, the Paul was Paul Bruce was a singer. To me, Bruce is a singer. Paul was a vocalist. He was a character. He was like Phil Lynott. He had some there, there was some there was his personality was part of if that makes sense. It yeah. does. It was it, it, the band would have never rose. There was a, other new wave of British heavy metal bands at the same time who were equally as good, but they would have never rose so quickly if Paul wasn't that special, had that special ingredient. Yeah. And he, and he, and he, and he was also a little bit of a curveball to everyone as well. That's you know? right. <laughs> but, oh, he's in the metal band. Okay. He kind of looks like Sid Vicious, uh, you That's know, right. yeah, like, yeah, a, like jacket, a, yeah. a, a bigger, meaner Sid Vicious. Yeah, it's true. And he it's had true. it, and he had it. And he was one of those guys that you know, back in the certainly back in the day, I I call it the X factor. There are certain people that when they walk on a stage, they don't have to jump off the That's off right. the drum riser and do splits. But if you're David Lee Roth, you should and could do that because it's amazing. But he had that character where he, he would walk on stage like Alex Harvey had. Where he'd walk on stage and you'd go, that guy's a star. Yeah. There was something about him. That, that he had a you wanted to watch him. It's like, then what's he going to do next? Kind of interesting. Interesting thing about Paul. I mean, he lived like whoever you thought he was. That's who he was off stage too. <laughs> you know, he lived. He lived the lifestyle. He he was he was the real deal. Uh... Yeah, Paul was a. Yeah, there, there was this, like when I was first moved to New York, there was talk of people were trying to get me and Paul together, mm-hmm. but I was already with RCA and yeah, Paul, Paul, Paul had a reputation. His reputation didn't scare me, but he did have a reputation because what you it wasn't a facade. No, it was not a facade. It was not a, it wasn't a stage character. It wasn't an alter ego. That was Paul Diano, and he was quite proud of the fact, as he should be. He was one of the characters, you know. One of Rock's characters. You know, I've interviewed him many, many times. I've talked to him many times. It's interesting thing about Paul's character. He didn't... There's some people who want to be on stage and jump around, look at me, look at me, look at me. He wasn't like that. He was just... If he's going to be on stage, great. If he's not, he wasn't looking for fame. It's sort of fame came to him in a sense. That Right. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, but, it, it does. It's because it's... He wasn't... It, it, yeah, there was something... There was there was a there was an honesty about Paul in more ways than one, if that yeah. makes. Sense. Like yeah, I said, yeah. it wasn't a facade; it wasn't a stage persona. That was just him. He, like from all the time I've known him for many years, I don't think I've ever he's not been someone to look at me, look at me on stage. He's just never been like that. If if he's on stage, he's on stage. If he's not, he's not. He didn't care. He just people were. He was like a magnet, you know, for yeah. for for. for like you said, he had that X, the, whatever that whatever that X factor is, whatever makes certain people stand out, just by being there. Tell me about your brief encounter with, or your crossing of paths with Iron Maiden. That's pretty interesting too. Well, what basically what? So I saw them. Then you know, once again, going back to those three little newspapers. Well, they weren't little; they were pretty damn big. And I would religiously go to the news agents every Thursday morning to get them. In Melody Maker in 79, a little ad like this big appeared saying Iron Maiden looking for a guitar player. So I grabbed one of our demos and I put it in the mail. And I got back, I printed out just in case. So this is this is a much blown up version of the ad, but that was tiny. Freaking tiny. It's big on this, but it was tiny. It was like an inch by inch at the most. So I, I sent them I sent them the tape in and I got I got a handwritten response back that said dear nick thanks for your interest but the guitar job is now filled good luck in the future best wishes and it this is this is the letter and they had an iron maiden stamp which i thought was great i don't know who hand wrote it i always meant I, i'm friends with nico and i kept meaning to go hey who wrote this damn thing but the reason there was a grim reaper stamp is because of this damn letter i'm like that's a cool idea i'm getting a, a grim reaper stamp made so <laughs> and I, and so, so I stamped my so my Iron Maiden stamp letter has the Reaper stamp below it just because. Is that I, amazing? I yeah, kept yeah. the original, yeah, because it's just one of those things. It's like you know, file under stuff you can't make up, and and they were unsigned at the time, which is why the ad was so damn small. 
<laughs> it's amazing to think that they took their time out to reply to you and thank you. A lot of bands wouldn't have done that. They would have just said, you know, next, next, let's move on, right? They wouldn't take the time out to, to write no, something. It's, 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 it's English. The, the, it's, it's, it's English politeness. Politenessism. No, it's 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 an English it's it's an English thing. It definitely is. We feel obliged to thank people. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. They didn't that's have okay. to, you know. I mean, they 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 probably what they meant to say. We haven't found a guitar player yet, but your tape sucks. They didn't say that. <laughs> that's, not, <laughs> that's not that's not the English thing to do, right? That would be. I'll say it again. So, anyways, what makes Iron Maiden's Made in Japan so special? Well, you know, is there anything you want to say to close off on that? No, I just think it captured it captures a moment in time beautifully. It catch and there's something about it. There's some when I listen to that, you can feel the energy and it makes me wish I was there. And that to me is the ultimate live recording. When you feel like you're in the room but you can't see anything and you wish you could go, for God's sake, let me see the band playing this. And well the, said. The, like, like like you said, running free is there's there's an energy there. They were running. They were running free on that track, and it's freaking great. And you can feel the hall, and you and no pun intended to like Doug Hall being the, the guy who engineered and produced it. But you know, that's why I remember tomorrow sound. Like you said, it had an ambience it, because it was played in a freaking great hall with a great sound engineer who who captured it really well. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it was and it was the killer's lineup. And this like to me, the like the 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 Smith Murray combination. Yeah, it's, that's Tipton Downing and those two guys. You know, um, Gorham Robinson. Those are timeless guitar duos that can you know, Young and Young can't forget that Hetfield, Hetfield Hammett. Yeah, yeah. Certain things you can't dick with because they're because they're just perfect. And that, you know, that was the first time they were recorded live. And there's something special, in, and I love Cl Clive Burr had a vibe about him as well. I love he him. had a vibe. He had definitely had a vibe. Very, very cool. 